Well, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you today. Thank you to this week's band, Awake, O Sleeper, and a special treat of having uh, Jenny lead us in all the songs. There's something really sweet about the female voice, isn't there? Yeah. Also, uh, to all the, the, the veterans and those who've put their lives at risk uh, for Memorial's Day, we appreciate you and wanted to say that as well. Uh, well, if you happen to be new or visiting, this is one of your first Sundays, I just want to welcome you. My name's Dwayne. I'm one of six pastors here who all serve equally together under our head and senior pastor, Jesus Christ. And it is good to, to serve him and in him to be at the head and the helm of our church. Uh, we take really seriously our job as, as pastors, and so one of the things we've been talking about in our church, we're in the middle of this 90-day giving challenge to address the health and maturity of our finances, and so all the members of our church have been uh, receiving phone calls from our pastors just to see if there's any way that we can help or serve you, any input that, that you have, and so some of you have already received a phone call, some of you, their phone calls still uh, coming, but it's been really sweet to be able to connect with many of you and to to see what God is doing in our church. There really is this sense of him pulling us together and bonding us together and a real clear hand of Jesus leading us and guiding us as a good pastor in our church. Uh, I haven't made any uh, official decisions yet in terms of what our new budget will look like and cuts and whatnot, but one one thing we do, we're about two-thirds of the way there and getting to where we would have at least a a month's running room uh, again. So that's that's good news. Uh, One of the main ways that we experience the the head pastorship, if you will, of Jesus in our church, his leadership, is by listening Listening to and learning from him in his word and what he actually said that was recorded for all time in this book, the Bible. I believe God instructed various men to write down and record what Jesus said so that we could listen to and follow and hear from him for all time. So this year we've been we've been doing that and going through Dr. Luke's record of Jesus' life and ministry. On Earth, and it's been it's been great fun. Each section, each week, really addresses almost a, a, a unique person or a unique way that that Jesus shows us. He engages and shows us what God is like, who we are as human beings, our our value and our worth, and the things that are wrong with the world and and ourselves that can be made right through Him. Uh, this week, we come on a section where Luke highlights the importance of women in Jesus ministry. Uh, If you were here at the beginning when we started the book a number of weeks ago at the beginning of the year, back at the beginning, you might remember that Luke's thesis, his angle, his, his, his thesis of the book is that Jesus is for all peoples, that Jesus is for, for all races, that he's for all ages, he's for all places, and he's for both genders, uh, both male and female. Thus far in in the book, Luke has actually been subtly highlighting the importance of women in the life and ministry of Jesus. First off with the role of his mother Mary and the things that that she says and the crucial place that she has in the life of Jesus. Then also with his aunt Elizabeth and and the things that she says and her role in all of this. And Anna the prophetess and the things that she says about Jesus. Luke has steadily been highlighting the importance the importance and the crucial significance that women have played in the life and ministry of Jesus. Now here in chapter 7, at the beginning of uh, chapter 8 that we're looking at today, Luke comes right out and says some things uh, straight out, just highlighting the women and their, their, their value and their worth in Jesus' life and ministry. He tells the story of this one woman and how she became a disciple of Jesus. We're going to talk in depth about that in a minute, but what, what you've got to know up front is that what Jesus did was radical, very radical. Women in the first century back then, they were seen as property owned by men. They were seen as property that were meant to be only seen and not heard. And, and until Jesus, no philosopher, not you know, Socrates, Aristotle, no rabbi, no Jewish rabbi, had, had ever publicly taken on any women as disciples. That was not done. So what Jesus did was, was quite Radical. So what we're going to see today is how Jesus confronted the social practices of his day and really restored women to their, their place of dignity and value and worth as females who are made in the image of God and have extreme worth and critical roles to play in our world. That's what we're going to be looking at today. Much More and more, as I look out onto the cultural landscape of the day and age that we 
live in, it seems to me that we're increasingly living in a time that, that reflects more and more of the time of how things were when Jesus walked the face of the earth. I mean, today in America, men don't wear robes. Those things are different, our, our dress and whatnot. But man, back then there were lots of different gods, lots of different religions and belief systems, and there was a lot of tension and fighting over those things. Back then, there was strong animosity and prejudice and segregation between races, particularly Jew and Gentile. There was police brutality from the Roman soldiers who regularly abused their place of authority. And women were suppressed and treated unjustly and unfairly. That that sounds somewhat familiar to the time we're, we're living in. Today, we're talking about women. And this year in our country, perhaps from a woman losing the presidential election race to a man that's made grotesque and misogynistic comments about women and their body parts, there's been a particular emphasis on women in our culture this year, on women and their rights. The annual Women's March this year, it had the largest gathering ever of 2.6 million people gathering at the Capitol to protest, making it the largest single-day protest in the entire U.S. history. Pretty incredible. Prominent female voices like Jennifer Lawrence have been speaking up about unequal wages and opportunities in the workplace. Meanwhile, the porn industry, which is built on the objectification of women and their body, the female body continues to grow and be one of the most profitable businesses in our country. So yeah. It's a big deal what we're talking about today. And I think what Jesus has to say to us is extremely relevant. So with that, let's go ahead and we'll read the text, acknowledge its goodness from God, and, and pray over it. So why don't you stand with me? And, and I'll say this before I, 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 I read it and pray. I just want to ask um, from all of you for a personal grace for, for me today. Uh, not an easy topic. This is sort of a hot-button issue. And I realize that I'm a guy up here talking about women that in some things might just be better from a woman being up here and saying some of these things, but I'm the guy that God's placed here, and this is my job, and so I want to do the best job that, that I can, and this isn't the first time that I've ever preached about women and, and their roles, and I think uh, every time that I have, no matter how sensitive and careful I've tried to be uh, and gone about it, I just, there's been something I haven't said just right, and there's been people that have been up, upset at me, and so just please have a little grace on me. I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm not Jesus like him, uh, but I'm trying to point to his, his goodness, and, and I really believe that Jesus is for women, and, and hope that we're able to see that today. So with that, let me go ahead and read the text and, and pray for our time in it. One of the Pharisees asked him, that's Jesus, to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned he was reclining at a table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and another 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. but She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, and from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Let me pray. Lord, I want to ask for your special grace today. Would you help me as your servant in speaking um, to speak graciously and kindly? I pray, God, for those gathered here. pray particularly those who are hurting, feeling, and carrying fear, guilt, shame, that you would minister to them the forgiveness and the hope that you offer. I pray for humility, God, that you enable us to be teachable and to learn from you and your word and what you have given us. I pray all these things in your good, good name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so what I want to do today is actually work backwards from uh, our text this morning. Uh, I want to work with the three verses in chapter 8 and then look at the story of the particular woman and then look at the larger picture of what Jesus uh, teaches us here about our relationship with with sinners, what that's supposed to look like. Uh, So I got three points for us to walk through in that feminist for Jesus, forgiveness from Jesus, and friends of Jesus. Uh, With this first point, feminist for Jesus, uh, I want us to notice some things that are said about these women that are, are named here, these three women that are honored here at the beginning of chapter 8. First off, we got Mary Magdalene. The Bible doesn't say what these evil spirits that Jesus freed her from were, were doing to her or what the infirmities were that she was uh, healed of. Some think uh, history, tradition have, have said that they think that that's actually Mary Magdalene. That could be. We don't know for sure the story of the woman that we're looking at today. What the Bible does tell us is that in response to Jesus' grace in her life, she became one of the most devoted followers of Jesus, one of his most devoted disciples. Now, when we talk about disciples, and you're, you're reading the Bible and you see disciples mentioned, there's, there's really three different kinds or levels of disciples, the way that they're referred to. There's, there's first off, there's the, the, the sort of top tier, the first tier, the official disciples. There's these 12 men that Jesus hand-selected to be a part of his three-year apprenticeship program, to be trained to be his his main leaders. Then there's the second tier, which we'll we'll call devoted disciples. These are people who heard the message of Jesus, and they believed, and they committed themselves to him, and became his devoted followers. Then there's a third group, which I'm just going to call temporary disciples. These are people who came across Jesus and his ministry, and they followed him for a little while. They were somewhat interested, but then after he said some, some difficult things and called them to some difficult things, they, they found it too hard and no longer believed or followed him as disciples. So three groups of, of disciples, official disciples, devoted disciples, and temporary disciples. Mary's part of that second group. She's a devoted disciple, and the, and the Bible gives her a very special place in the story of Jesus. Uh, When Jesus, first when he died on the cross, all of his disciples abandoned him out of fear of being associated with them, fear of punishment. They all left him alone. But guess guess who didn't leave him? Guess what disciple didn't? Mary Magdalene. Uh, Then when, after when Jesus died and he took his body down off the cross, Guess who who followed him all the way to the tomb and stood there watching all the way until they closed the door of the tomb? Mary Magdalene. Then, after that, perhaps the biggest honor placed on any of Jesus' disciples, any of them all, guess who the very first person is that Jesus shows himself to after he rises from the dead on the third day? Mary Magdalene. (laughs) She's the first person Jesus speaks to. She's, she's weeping and mourning and sorrow, and Jesus is behind her, and he says her name, Mary. And she turns around and sees the risen Lord, and she, she grabs him and hugs him and holds him so tight that Jesus is basically like, you're hurting me? I'm like, like, let go. You've got to go tell people that I've risen. And so she goes out and says, I have seen the Lord. <laughs> Pretty incredible. The, the risen Jesus showing himself to Mary first, is a really, really big deal. You see, it's actually one of the best arguments for the authenticity and accuracy of the story of Jesus and his resurrection and what the Bible records is actually true. The reason is this. In the first century, a woman's testimony was considered unreliable. So they weren't even allowed to give testimony. You couldn't be a witness in court because you can't trust what a woman says. So, if the story of Jesus' resurrection, the story of the things that Jesus said and did were a myth that was made up, that was being fabricated. You, 
you don't put women being the first one that discovered Jesus as risen. That doesn't help your cause. That, that makes your story untrustable and unreliable. Works against you. So you see here, Mary, there at the cross, there at the burial, there at the resurrection, Mary Magdalene actually turns out to be Jesus' best disciple. She wins. Like, Mary was the best disciple. So honored in the place in the story of Jesus. Then we got Joanna. She's the wife of Shusa and Herod's, Herod's household manager. You know who Herod is? He's the Jewish king. She, she's, that's a big job, a big deal. She's managing his household. He's got tons of servants and staff. She's overseeing all of them and also all of his property and his land holdings. She oversees all of that. She's got a really high and important job, Joanna. Then there's Susanna. We don't know much about her other than that she had a lot of money and she was really generous with it. Verse 3 says that she provided for, for Jesus financially out of her own means. Jesus' ministry, just like the ministry of our church, it, it took money. It required money. Money enables the mission to move forward. It requires people who have money to give a portion of their money to help the ministry of Jesus happen. One of the things we're learning. And, and Susanna, she, she's a very generous person with what God had given her. The picture of, of Joanna and Susanna here and in the story of the Bible I think it's, they're just such great examples of the picture that the Bible gives of what a godly, uh, truly feminine woman looks like in the Bible from Proverbs chapter 31. And so I thought it would be really fitting for us today just to, to read this picture of, of, of a woman from, from the Bible in Proverbs 31. Here's what it says. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rides well, it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hand. She plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the staff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. <laughs> this woman's like off the hook, right? I mean... Think about it. She's a realtor. She's a cook. She's a farmer. She's an entrepreneur. I mean, she makes good money. She's a good mom. She's a good wife, a loving wife. She, she works out. Did you hear that part? She makes her arms strong. So she's into fitness too. She's beautiful. She's kind. She's gracious. She's godly. She's respected. This woman is incredible. I can't believe that she married me. Uh, Serious, this is how I, I feel about my wife, except for the snow part, because she hates the snow. Um, like, this is my wife. She's, she's wonderful. In all seriousness, I think that the picture the Bible gives here of, of a true and godly feminist is, is so large. I mean, what's it painting? It's saying there's hardly anything a woman can't do. Hardly anything she can't do. It's saying a woman is, is highly valuable and she should, be, she should be free to put her gifts and her talents to work and to be who God made her to be. Excellent. Praiseworthy. Our country has come a, a long way from a time when women were not allowed to vote and were just kind of expected to always be at home cooking and being with the kids and cleaning. 
Uh, but just like when there's been a, a history of injustice, you know, akin to the history of racial prejudice in our country, it, it leaves a, a lasting imprint and attitude that can kind of carry over and continue to affect the way that a woman feels and the way that women are treated in subtle ways that we may not realize. <sighs> now, because of that, what's happened a lot in our country is is this reaction with this thing called feminism, okay, in our culture. Feminism can mean different things to different people, uh, but basically it's a movement or an ideology meant to swing the the pendulum back to give women equal rights and equal standing, which is, at its heart, a really, really good and godly thing, I believe. God created both male and female in his image and both are equally valuable and honored in his sight as male and female. However, what happens, I think, with some feminist talk is that the the pendulum swings a little bit too far back. We're in the attempt to restore the value and the dignity of women. It does so at expense of gender, at the expense of gender and the God-given distinction and roles that he created. Uh, One example of this is a popular book that's been going around lately titled Jesus Feminist by Sarah Bessie. Uh, I read the first three chapters of her book this week. She, what you need to know about her is she rejects the complete inspiration and authority of the Bible and she reimagines a different view of God and a different kind of relationship between the man and woman and their roles uh, at home and in the world. Here's what she writes. She says, patriarchy is not God's vision for humanity. She calls herself an egalitarian and believes that leadership is not determined by gender, but by the gifting and calling of the Holy Spirit. That can sound good, but the problem is that the Bible introduces us to God as Father, the divine patriarch, and Jesus instructs us to pray to him as such. When we look at who God is and who he presents himself to be. In the Bible, he presents himself as a holy trinity, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three you have equal value and honor and dignity within the Godhead, but each have different roles. The Father is sovereign and oversees all. The Son, Jesus, he works the work of redemption and salvation. The Holy Spirit empowers us and is God's activity at work in our lives. Regardless of whether we like it or not, our roles as men and women, that the Holy Spirit gives to us to do, uh, they, they have to do with gender. They have to do with gender. There's a fact. Men cannot have babies. That is a role that is defined by gender. And God very clearly, in numerous places in the Bible, I'm not going to go through them all today, it calls men to lovingly lead their homes, protecting and providing for their wife and children. Women want to be loved and cared for. But that's why, the, that's why the Bible's really hard on men, calling them not to abdicate or abuse that role. It's when they do that women get hurt. And then they're like, well, that doesn't feel good, so I don't like that. I need to protect myself from any man, any male leadership. In my opinion, there's a lot better book out there I would, I would suggest to you. It's titled Accidental Feminist by a gal named... Courtney Resseg, here she, she is. I, I wish she were here because then I would just have her up on stage to talk today. I actually had my assistant try to see if we could get her. Turns out she's like in Little Rock, Arkansas or something, so she couldn't be here today. Uh, but I thought I'd read some words from her book. Here's what she, she writes. Oh, Although many Christians wouldn't identify themselves as feminists, the reality is that the feminist movement has influenced us all in profound ways. We unconsciously reflect our culture's ideas related to womanhood rather than what's found in the Bible. I'm an accidental feminist. For many years, I unwittingly possessed some heart attitudes that made me a classic feminist. I believe many women today find themselves confused, just as, like I was as an early Christian. Part of my rebellion against things that I deemed too domestic or feminine was rooted in my misunderstanding of what it means to be a Christian woman. What exactly does it look like to be a Christian wife? Is it baking cookies, keeping an immaculate home, and being a mom to five kids? What about the woman who's a baking novice or, like me, a baking failure? Is womanhood only about quiet and sensitive types? What about the woman who has a career? 
the woman who can't have kids or simply doesn't want a quiverful? What about the woman who doesn't feel gifted to teach in her local church? Is there a place for her? What about the woman who does? Does she? What about the vast number of single women in our churches today? Is there room for these sisters? Caricatures of womanhood are what get us into trouble when we reduce womanhood to the tasks we accomplish or the cultural expectations or talents and personality traits. We're doing a disservice to women everywhere. Recovering from feminism and embracing God's idea of womanhood is far more than a throwback to a 1950s television show. What I failed to understand was that true freedom cannot be found in independence from any authority at all. True freedom is found in understanding our creator and how he wants us to live. True freedom is knowing that this world has meaning and we are created for a purpose. True freedom is knowing that God had a good design when he created us male and female. I I think that's helpful. I, I hope that it is. Essentially what I'm saying today is that Jesus is for women. He is, he is for women being truly feminine, free to the fullest, fully feminine. I talked to my wife this week about this, knowing that I was probably going to get shot today and, uh, on this issue and run my sermon by her. And uh, she said that what, what pretty much all women she, she thinks deal with are, are three things. Fear that they won't be taken care of, guilt, that somehow they've, they've done something wrong, or shame, that they're simply not enough. What, what Jesus does is he elevates women. He takes away the, the fear because he's trustworthy, because I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus will never hurt you. He takes away any guilt because he, he takes it on himself and he dies for it all, past, present, and future. And then he takes away the shame because he says, you are enough and I love you deep down in who you truly are as a person. That's what Jesus does. Jesus is a Jesus who is for women. Jesus is for women. Them being feminine to the fullest. Well, it's been a longer point, I, I know. I pray helpful, pray helpful to us. Male and female created in the image of God to be fully male and be fully female and who he's made us to be. Well, let's transition now and look into the story where Jesus elevates this particular woman and really takes away her fear, guilt, and shame and restores her. Second main point, forgiveness from Jesus. First, let me set the scene here. Uh, it was likely after one of the times when Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, the church of the day, and one of the, the church leaders, the religious leaders, like the pastors, that they invite him over to his house for lunch to discuss uh, his teachings, Jesus' teachings. These kind of uh, lunches were pretty common. They were usually in uh, like an outdoor patio of sorts where they would gather for a meal. And, and the way they did meals in that day, they would kind of lay down and lean on one elbow and they'd eat with the other hand with their legs behind them. And, and they would converse at the table. Uh, the public was welcome to these kinds of discussion luncheons, and so they would often, they were allowed to stand on the outer courtyard that would be in the middle of where that meal is. They couldn't take part in the discussion, but they could listen in to be able to learn from what was being said. So during this, this meal that's happening, this, this woman enters in. And, and what you've got to know, and just in case there's any kids in the room for their parents, that a little bit PG-13 section of the sermon at this point, but what you got to know is that this woman uh, was a prostitute. Um, that's who she is. Uh, Luke calls her a woman of the city, which is saying she works the streets. Uh, uh, Simon, the Pharisee, he calls her a, sin, a sinner. That's a, a nice euphemism there for whore. Uh, and, and he condemns Jesus for his kindness to her because you know, what he says, despite who and what sort of woman this is. Okay? So it's pretty clear the Bible is being gentle here in describing who this, this woman is and what kind of life she's lived. So imagine with me this scene. This woman had heard Jesus teach. She'd heard him speak about the, the grace and the forgiveness and the hope that could be found in him, that anybody, no matter what they've been through and lived, that they could be restored. And something happened in her heart, and she, 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 she found herself believing that that could be her too, that even her, that Jesus would have love and grace and forgiveness for her and that there could be hope for her life. And so she finds herself believing and she goes home and she grabs this jar of alabaster oil 
jar of alabaster oil was worth about a whole year's worth of wages. Think about that. That's what she did for a job. A whole year of giving her body away to men who abused her and mistreated her. All the wages, all the money she earned from that. She grabs the jar and she goes to the luncheon. First she's standing at the, I imagine, at the, the outer courtyard holding the jar and just looking and listening in and thinking about what she had been feeling and she's looking at Jesus and she's listening to Jesus and she begins to, to tremble. She's trying to, 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 to fight back the, the tears. But as she is thinking of all the, all the things that she had given her body away to that had caused her soul to die within her and then she just, she, she, she can't help anymore. She, she bursts into tears and she, she, she walks forward. She kneels at Jesus' feet and she's sobbing. She breaks the alabaster jar of oil. She pours it all over his feet. She lets her hair down, which was illegal. So she's giving up her job, even putting herself in further at risk. She's casting herself at the mercy of Jesus. <laughs> she's trusting herself in all those years, kissing other so many men and so many places. And now she kisses the feet of her Savior. What a moment. Jesus doesn't stop her. He could have. Social norms would, would have expected him to, that he, he, he should have, but, but he doesn't. Instead, he, he welcomes her. He says, your, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Hmm. This week as I was studying the text and trying to get in the heart and the, the mind of this woman, I, um, I contacted a couple people. One, a gal whom the Lord's been working a lot on her heart. She's been years stripping at one of the local clubs here and she's been coming to the church off and on and experiencing some grace in her life. I contacted her and then I talked to Dave Chrisman, our host for, for today, who's our city engagement director, is doing a lot of work to initiate uh, work in our city to address human trafficking uh, that you guys have been hearing about. Uh, it was helpful. Uh, if you know what human trafficking is, the passing of men, women, boys, and girls for sex acts for money. That's what human trafficking is. And San Diego is the fifth highest city in the entire country for where this takes place. So big deal in, in our city. Uh, no one ever, uh, you know, thinks as a little kid, oh, you know, when I grow up one day I want to be a prostitute. I want to be a stripper. Nobody, nobody thinks that. Uh, but so many... Gals and, and boys, too, they end up in that. How does that, how does that happen? It happens in a couple ways. One that's really big in our city right now is through this thing called boyfriending. It happens as low as middle school, and particularly among gangs, they'll, uh, they'll have young boys that are a part of their gang, and they'll encourage them to, to get a girlfriend, and they call them Romeos. And, and so they'll get a girlfriend and convince this girl that he loves her and, and get her to have sex with them. And then, and then they'll, they'll say something like, um, oh, if you really love me, you'll do this other thing too. Let's do this threesome with a friend of mine. And, um, and so then he manipulates her into doing that. And then after that, encouraging her to do this and this, uh, this other thing and then this too. And, and then if the girl is resistant, says, hey, if you don't, then we're going we're gonna to have pictures of what we already have over the internet. We're going to let everybody know what you've been doing. Or if she's really resistant, they'll, they'll even threaten her family. <laughs> That's how it happens. And so they get... They get locked and then trapped into this life of being trafficked around. Happens also a lot with high school and, and college-age girls. The interest in modeling, that sounds great. Uh, I'll respond to oftentimes on ads on Craigslist. The San Diego Reader did a, a cover article on this just a few months ago. Just in, uh, There was one that got busted. Nice hotel, Hard Rock Hotel downtown. They'll set up shop in a hotel room. A girl will come in to do this photo shoot. And then they'll, they'll encourage her to take some take some more clothes off and do, you know, do some nude shots and, and then talk about more, what, more money if she goes fully nude and they come back again. And, and then they start threatening to, if, if they don't do it, then likewise, then they'll post all these things and release it and let everybody know. And the girl gets in, entrapped in this life of being passed around from man to man for money. But it's not just those who've been trafficked either. Slowly seeing... A woman's body as a sex object is so huge in our culture. Think about it. Movies, TV, music, clothing, the ads everywhere, shopping malls. It's everywhere. And we need to think about the kind of damage that that, that causes in our human psyche and, and, and the grace that those who have been exploited see. 
I got a short video for us to help us with that. So once again, I know, um, parents, I saw some of you take your kids out. Probably, probably smart move, so thank you. Uh, you might need some tissue for this one. Here it is. Lord, have mercy, right? I'm a, I'm a father to three girls, three daughters. What every woman needs to know here in this room is that you are a daughter of God. I would never wish that any of my daughters fall on this, but daughters do. What you need to hear and know today is that the forgiveness that Jesus offers is one that wipes away the pain and the hurt and the scars and the damage done to your soul. That Jesus, he, he offers healing and restoration to the broken. Friends, this is what we have to offer our city. The forgiveness and the hope that it comes to us through Jesus Christ. That's what God the Father has given to us. The daughters can be restored and healed. Now here's the thing. It's really easy to look in on the story of the woman in our text or anybody that's been trapped. And they go, oh, poor girl. Yeah, she needed forgiveness. Yeah, totally. But Jesus actually corrects that way of thinking. Look at verse 47, talking to Simon, the religious leader, who didn't think he was a sinner too. He says this, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. What Jesus is pointing out is that there's no one 
who is better than the woman in the story? No one. Everyone needs forgiveness. It's what Simon couldn't see. He couldn't see that he needed forgiveness just as much as this woman, and that's why he didn't love Jesus like this woman loved Jesus. That's why Jesus tells the whole story about the the guy being forgiven a great debt to, to try and help Simon see that he too had a great, great debt. What Jesus says here is really true. If you feel a lack of empathy, we talked about compassion last week, if you feel a lack of love toward people, it's likely because you have not yet experienced the grace and the forgiveness from Christ that you need. (laughs) You want to be a a more loving person? Then then be courageous enough to open up yourselves and, and, and admit what's really there and how you've hoard yourself out and the forgiveness that you need from God and what he provides for you in Christ. You, you go to that level, it, it will change you. It'll make you so much more compassionate, so much more loving, so much more forgiving. So the Bible says, Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another, be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. A good question to ask yourself anytime you're reading the Bible is, who am I in this story? In this story, you've only got two options because you're not Jesus. So you, you're either prideful Simon or you're the penitent woman. What Jesus wants us to see is that all of us are really this woman. We've all had hurtful and harmful things done to us, and we've all done things with our bodies that we know are wrong and sinful. What we need is the love and the forgiveness of God. Our problem is that too often we're like Simon and we're too prideful to admit that and to see that. Some of you today, you know, you're here and you're, you're just like this woman. Maybe, maybe you were trafficked or maybe you, you gave yourself to a man and gave your body to him and, and he betrayed that, that love and that trust. It scarred you. There's forgiveness. There's forgiveness and healing and and hope in Christ for you today. Some of you today, what you actually need, what you need is to, to become like this woman, to see yourself as this woman. Maybe you've thought, oh, you're one of the, the good guys. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a sinner, and, and that's soured your soul. There's forgiveness and healing from Christ. You'd be courageous enough to see your need and open yourself to it and turn to him. Jesus is for women. Jesus is for women like this woman, and he's for all who are bold enough and courageous enough and humble enough to admit that they're like this woman too, which is all of us. Let's conclude today with our final point, a short one, friends of Jesus. The attitude of Simon in this story seems to me to be a patronizing one. He he extends this invitation to Jesus to come over for lunch, but he doesn't offer him anything that like a normal good host would when they come over to their house. He, I mean, they, they didn't have paved roads back then, so they walked dirt roads, and there was dung in it from the horses and stuff, so, and you're laying close to a table, so normal grace would be to wash you, and he guests feet, offer them oil so it doesn't stink up the meal. Um, you know, they come to your house, you, we, we usually give a hug or a handshake. Back then it was a kiss. He doesn't give them any of that. Uh, Simon basically has, it shows no respect for Jesus. At dinner, he actually berates Jesus. Look at verse 39. He says, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is that he's allowing to, to touch him, for she's a sinner. Uh, he knows that people saw Jesus as a prophet from God. Jesus saw himself that way, but he doesn't address him as prophet. He just, he's like, oh, teacher, supposed teacher. Okay. Uh, His reasoning, this man's reasoning, is that if a man of God should not associate or welcome or befriend sinners. That's his his reasoning, like Jesus does with this woman. In contrast, here's how Jesus reasons. He says, hey, uh, if you're a man or a woman of God, then you will welcome and befriend sinners. If If you know the God of love and mercy... I mean, that's, that's going to make you extend that to others and welcome that in. If you don't, maybe you don't. 
really know God. If you're a man or a woman of God, you better associate and welcome into friendship people who are sinners. See, too often I think that we, we look at the world and, and we judge it. And, and I, we think it owes us something and we're, we're upset at people in situations when they don't go right or when people mistreat us. I, uh, I was at the gym the other day. I, I'm trying out some new gyms, you know, because I'm kind of over the why. Nobody there seems to, like, want to work out. They just sit on stuff and look at their phones. So I'm doing, like, the, the, the free pass circuit. Everybody's got a, a seven-day path, free pass, you know. So, like, I did choose this last week. And uh, I was there with a buddy in our church that I've been working out with and been discipling for a couple of years. And so we, the, the first day we went in there and to check in, and there was this, this guy that... Uh, he, he kind of spoke in that, that tone that let me kind of know his, his orientation. And he asked if me and uh, my, my buddy were together, you know. And uh, I, I, I don't know why I did this, but I was just like, oh, no, no, we're not together. Um, and then because of that, the, guy, the guy's attitude toward me, it really shifted and changed. He, was, he became very curt and, and actually really, really rude because uh, he felt offended by that, I think. And uh, I was working out and... Uh, in the middle of my, my workout, I just felt the Spirit of God nudging me because I realized that I was, I was mad. I was like, I, I can't believe that guy was so rude. Here I am, I'm a potential customer. That's terrible customer service. And how dare him, like, reject me just because I'm not gay? Like, that's, that's so unfair. And, and I just felt the Spirit of God nudging me. Like, Dwayne, <laughs> that's the exact reason why you need to be kind and gracious to this person and be loving and, and, and friendly to him. And so... Okay, you're right, Lord. And, and felt God begin to soften my heart. So as I walked out this, the other day, you know, after my seven days, because I started seeing him every day that I was going to the gym, and, and his name's Justin, and, and, I, and I walked up and said, Justin, I, just, I want you know, I really appreciate you. Thank you for helping me get, you know, connected with the gym and showing me a, around. And I don't know if I'm going to stay here or not, but I just, I just really a, appreciate you, man. You should have seen the smile that beamed on this guy's face. His whole attitude and demeanor toward me completely. He, he shook my hand. He's like, well, man, I, like, I, I hope you come back and get to see you again. If not, maybe I'll see you around in the city and, and whatnot. And it was really great to meet you. <laughs> uh, sweet situation. I, I've just been realizing, you see, we have to, I need to stop seeing the world as, as a place that, that owes me something. And if someone doesn't treat me just right, then being like upset. No, that's that's the world that we live in. That's what we should expect. And those are opportunities for us to show off the love and the grace and the mercy and the kindness of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And to show them what a good church looks like. That they might, they might want to be friends with us and that they, may, they might want to come to this place and, and do this thing with us and be the loving body of God. Yeah. Everyone is hurting. Everyone needs a friend that can show them the love and the grace of Jesus. Philip Ryken, he's currently the president of Wheaton College. I read this this week, and I thought what he, he wrote was good. Here's what Philip Ryken says. The love of Christ is to govern our responses to the girl at school who has a reputation for sleeping around, to the homeless man addicted to crack cocaine, to the openly gay couple in our apartment building, to the inmate with a violent record, to the family member who scorns the gospel, to the pastor who denies the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. The love of Christ leads us to build relationships with the obvious sinners we know, too often, we don't have relationships with them at all, or if we do, our contempt for their sin shows through. They can tell what we really think of them, and this hinders them from ever hearing the gospel we want to give them. Our theme for a church this year is, one word, engage. Engage. We want to we engage people in our city, and here's the truth. I think if we're honest, we're actually not that good at it. Uh, and so I want to push us a bit today. I want to encourage us to engage, to just jump in, to figure it out, to, to get messy, to put yourself in situations and, and into friendships that you wouldn't normally, to go out of your way. I'm endeavoring to learn myself how to make more friends with sinners so that we might engage with the good gospel of Jesus Christ. And I hope you'll enjoy me with that. In the story today, Jesus, he, he shows us what it's like to engage there's a good book out there. Uh, if you haven't picked it up, I'd really encourage you to. It's Friendship, Friends with Sinners, an Approach to Evangelism, written by my friend Harvey Turner. It's an easy read. It's, you, uh, it gives really good practical aids in how to do this, how you can get better at it. So pick, pick it up 
basically what his point is is simple, that Jesus is a friend of sinners. That's what he was known for. That's what the Bible says about him, that he was known as a friend of sinners. So if Jesus was a friend of sinners, and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then you should be a friend of sinners too. So I encourage you to check that out and pray that God gives us some friends who are sinners. Man. The story today, Jesus shows us what it's like to welcome in and forgive people. And his forgiveness is unique and powerful because it's divine. That's why in verse 49, the people at the table, they say, who is this that he even forgives sin? What was really well known that day, and especially among the, the Jews who knew the Bible really well, is that the Bible is really clear that only God can forgive sin. So, so, so Jesus here really is acknowledging his deity and forgiving sin, extending it to the woman. It was well known then that God alone can forgive sin. That's what's not well known for us today. We try to, we try to work off our sin, or we try to cover it up and pretend it's not there. It's not that big of a deal, but it doesn't work. That's why we need a divine Savior to forgive us and to pour the love of his Holy Spirit into our hearts. Jesus can forgive sin because he's God and because he died on the cross to pay the price for all of our sins so that we might be restored in the relationship with God. That restoration cost us his life so that he could give to us for our salvation. That's forgiveness. Jesus, he's, he's for women and for all who are sinners like this woman. May God help us to be people who are for sinners too. Amen.